ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاهما بعد Welcome to another uh, Tuesday's open Q&A and as usual we choose uh, or I choose some of the more pertinent and relevant questions that I think are going to be of use for a broader audience once again the email to use is askyq at epicmasjid.org askyq at epicmasjid.org you'll see that on your screen as well and also please I keep on reiterating that uh, even though I'm the one that reads the email, so I will be reading directly, I cannot answer questions privately. So please understand, I have to choose maybe less than 5% of the questions that are going to be of the most benefit to the largest amount of viewers. Uh, and so I quickly skim through and I choose, so please don't get frustrated or irritated because otherwise I would not have anything to do. In fact, even if I were to spend all day, I would not be able to answer the amount of questions that come in. So please understand, I have to choose that which is the, the, the largest benefit insha'Allah and I cannot answer personal or private questions specific fatawa about your situation that are very unique to you uh, please go to your local uh, scholars I will answer generic questions such as the ones we'll do today I've gathered three or four questions that are all pertinent to uh, the topic of marriage and these are common types of marriages that take place and so I've gathered a number of them together and we'll be commenting on all of them simultaneously so let us let us begin Brother Hatim from Saudi Arabia emails asking if I can discuss my thoughts on what is called a misyar marriage. I'll explain all of these terms as we go along. So he wants to know misyar marriage and my take on this type of marriage. Uh, Brother Muhammad from New York emails saying that once again misyar marriage that he has uh, that it is said or is it true that the misyar marriage that some ulama have allowed is the same as the mut'a marriage uh, that the uh, 12 Shia allow. So he's asking is, is misyar the same as mut'a or is it equivalent to mut'a? Uh, Sister Sarah from London emails asking about a marriage in which the public is not informed and no one knows apart from uh, the two witnesses and of course the couple, uh, i.e. a secret marriage, is this allowed or not? Brother Hussein from Singapore asks about what is known as Zawaj al-Urfi uh, and he says that he has read a fatwa from al-Azhar that says that it is allowed. So can I comment on, these, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, type of marriage? Now, obviously, all of these questions have one thing in common, and that is specific types of marriages. For many of you who are hearing these, this question, these terms are going to be completely unknown. And for some of you, you will know some of them and not all, and some of you will know all of these types of marriages. So, I will do all of these questions in one response. And there's no doubt that the issue of nikah, the issue of marriage, is of course one of the key chapters of the chapters of fiqh, and our sharia has revealed so many laws governing it, uh, and uh, the goal of course is that the sharia wants to protect both the husband and the wife. And as usual, when it comes to the procedure for nikah, as is to be expected, there are some agreed upon areas, and there are some gray areas. And uh, some of the issues that are agreed upon are of course, you know, the husband and the wife have to be uh, uh, both uh, uh, agreeing to marry one another or the potential husband and wife and that uh, the, the procedure of ijab and qabul, the offer and the acceptance must take place uh, and the issue of the mahar uh, must take place as well. Uh, one of the contentious areas, I'm not going to talk about that today, is the issue of the wali. I have spoken about the wali in two very lengthy questions and you can listen to my responses over there. I'm not going to repeat over here what I have said, uh, but to, simply to summarize that the position that I have advocated and follow, uh, which is uh, the majority position when it comes to the unmarried uh, female, that she does need her wali's permission. Without her wali's permission, there is no nikah. And the position that I follow for the one who has been um, previously married and then divorced or widowed, is that for her, the wali becomes a technicality. And and that uh, even if a wali says no, she can choose another wali to perform the nikah. And I also said that in the case of an unmarried lady, 
if her wali is being unreasonable, then she has the right to appeal to a higher authority and present her case. And the higher authority, uh, typically a school group of scholars in her vicinity will look into what is happening and they have the right to take the wali, uh, the right of the wilaya away from the wali uh, because he is doing dhulm, if he is doing dhulm. And if he's not doing dhulm and it is his right, then they will not do so. So this is the position that I advocate, that's in a nutshell. I've given the evidences for that in the other Q&A. Today, of course, we're talking about slightly different questions related to the marriage. And uh, all of these involve types of marriages in which the ideal marriage is not intended. The romanticized notion of a long-term, uh, uh, healthy, loving relationship is, uh, you know, family being started, uh, that's not really what is intended. And there's a gray area. Some of those idealistic or, 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 or uh, ideal, I should say, not idealistic, some of those ideal goals are not intended or are explicitly put into conditions that they are not going to be done in this particular marriage. And so at what point when you chip away from the ideal marriage, at what point will the Sharia intervene and say, no, enough is enough, you cannot go over there. And realize, of course, that the goal of the Sharia in placing all of these conditions is to protect both parties and especially the more vulnerable party, which is typically the woman in a marriage. So the notion of the wali is, of course, uh, perfectly uh, illustrative of this point. The purpose of the wali is to raise the bar of the suitor. And every man knows this, that when he has to approach the wali of the lady, it changes the entire game than if he has to approach the lady uh, directly. The purpose of the mahar, it is understood to protect the lady financially. The purpose of the witnesses, the publicity uh, of the marriage is so that it is documented properly. Uh, the proposal and the acceptance is done so that we understand that both parties are willing. So this is the skeletal outline of a proper nikah. The proper nikah must have a number of ne necessary uh, pillars, arkan. And of them, this is not a fiqh class, but of them is that the potential husband and wife are available, in other words, they're not yani, already booked. If a lady is married, she cannot get married at that time. Uh, if the husband has four wives, he cannot take a fifth wife. So they're both available. They're halal for one another. So they cannot be, you know, for example, uh, having been fostered by the same mother. So they're available, they're willing, they're halal for one another. Uh, and uh, the fact that the wali, if she's unmarried, uh, has agreed, previously unmarried uh, has agreed, the mahar must be there, and uh, the witnesses must be present, the minimum of two witnesses. By the way, this is the skeletal nikah. By the way, no scholar in Islamic history has ever said that of the conditions of the nikah is that a sheikh or an imam or a mulwi sahab be present, not at all. And uh, the reason why we bring in a scholar or a sheikh is to make sure that the conditions of the nikah are met just because we want a person of religious authority. But we have to be careful. As Muslims, we should not go down the route of, let's say, Catholics, because Catholics believe that a marriage cannot take place without, a, without an actual priest, and the priest has a God-given right it's a sacrament, it's a God-given right that only the priest can bring this husband and wife, you know, by, by the power invested in me, uh, by God, that I can bring this couple together. We do not have a priesthood and a clergy in Islam, and if the husband and wife and the wali and the two witnesses and the mahr, if all of this is there, then the nikah can take place and you don't have to have any shaykh or alim. It can be done in the living room of the bride or the groom's house and everybody is present over there. And it's, be, it's gonna be the acceptance and proposal uh, can, should be between the wali and between the uh, husband-to-be. And when that is done with the mahr and the witnesses and everything, then alhamdulillah the nikah has taken place. Now, the question arises, what if the goals that the ideal marriage should have are not intended. And that's where each one of these different nikah, nikahs takes place. Nikah al-Misyar is one of them. Nikah al-Urfi is one of them. The secret nikah is one of them. So all of these types of nikah, they are chipping away at the ideal default understanding. So what then are we going to do when that is the case? We're gonna go over these one by one. The first of these questions that we're gonna cover is what is known as the misyar marriage. Now the term misyar is not classical Arabic, it's a modern term uh, that is based upon a dialect of Arabia found in, uh, of Arabic found in Saudi Arabia, a Bedouin dialect. So it is not classical Arabic and it is a very modern term, misyar. And what it means is to make things easy. 
okay? It's to make things easy. And the practice of misyar marriage, it became somewhat common uh, only recently, literally 20 years ago or so, 25 years ago. Before this point in time, uh, the concept of misyar as we understand it now, it might have existed anecdotally, it might have been found on the rare occasion, but it was not anything that was known as a cultural phenomenon. So, misyar marriage dates back to 20, 30 years, uh, very recent history in our own lifetimes, and it became prevalent uh, uh, in the beginning uh, in Saudi Arabia, and then be, it spread across uh, the Middle East and across the world after that. And because of this, multiple fatawa were released in the last 20 years or so, uh, some for some against the, the concept of misyar. <laughs> now, what exactly is misyar? Misyar uh, is the a marriage that takes place when a man and woman obviously agree to marry, and the woman agrees to give up some of the rights and the privileges that the Sharia ah makes obligatory upon the man. And that's why it's the ease marriage, the marriage of ease. The reason why this phenomenon began 25 years ago, I, I, when I say began, I, I mean it became common or more common, was that there was and there still is uh, a larger percentage of women who wanted to get married but could not find a husband compared to the percentage of men who wanted to get married and could not find a wife. So spinsterhood increased in the women of that region. And many women were simply not finding a husband. And as their ages increased, and as we are aware, marriage is based upon, a lot of it is based upon one's looks and one's age and so forth. So as one's age increases, the prospects diminish. And so uh, people started saying that, you know, some people started saying that, look, I don't mind, you know, marrying uh, some of the, the men of that region said, uh, I don't mind marrying a second uh, wife, but I cannot afford a second wife financially. And it so happened that many of these ladies are career ladies, and they have jobs, and they have an income. So they're not, they're not interested in a husband for money, but they want a husband for companionship, for what Allah has made halal between a man and a wife, and maybe even to start a family. And so they would say, I don't mind you, don't pay anything. I'll take care of my rent. I don't need you to take care of my rent, but I want a husband. And so the condition was put that the husband does not have to, for example, take care of the wife, now financially. Now, once you open this door, the market becomes a free for all. And so men and women, each one of them, begin to negotiate, you know, the men are offering less and less, and the women are agreeing to whatever is being offered for whatever their reasons might be. And notice here, of course, that misyar marriages, they do have the wali, and they do have the witnesses, and they do have, you know, a mahar, sometimes it's a token mahar, because the mahar, by unanimous consensus, the mahar can be small or large, yani there's no ikhtilaf amongst the ulama. The mahar, if the husband and wife agree, it can be one dollar, one riyal, one lira, uh, and if the husband and wife agree, it can be, yani one mil, if they want to, and if it would be a type of isra for many of us, but one million dollars, I mean, technically it's halal. So, if the husband and wife agree that the mahar is one dollar, and I'm not gonna pay you any support after this marriage, and we will be husband and wife. And the woman agrees to this. This is a type of misyar. Now, this began, as I said, you know, a few decades ago, and an industry was born where matchmakers would pair potential partners and each side would offer what they're willing to negotiate on. So a man would go to this partner maker, the middleman, the middle person, it became an industry. You would pay, you know, hundreds of dollars to the middle person. And this middle person would compile the res resumes of the men and the re resumes of the woman and would negotiate and agree. So men would say, for example, that I can only give one night of the week. I don't have time uh, to, to spend. I want one night of the week and I'll give this much per month for rent. And the woman, uh, for whatever reason, would also say, okay, you know what, I'm fine with only one night and the rest you can spend with your other wife and uh, I'm not looking for a traditional marriage. Uh, and some men would say, I will spend full time, but I'm not going to give any money. And so the woman might have w plenty of wealth, she might have inherited wealth, she might run her own business, she might be a career lady, and the man has no job. And she wants uh, a husband and an actual family to start, so she will agree to take on the finances as long as the husband becomes a husband to her. So all of this opens up the door to misyar. So to summarize what is misyar, misyar basically means, 
and this is of course a modern term, it's not a fiqhi term, is a type of marriage in which the woman, and it's always the woman in the misyan marriage, uh, because the, 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 the burden of time and the burden of finances is on the man. So if the woman agrees to drop either time or finances, or a portion of time or finances, or complete time and finances, basically no expectations, and simply agrees to have a person in her life, a man uh, who will become her husband, uh, and they agree to this before the marriage, and it is solidified, and the marriage takes place with the wali, with the witnesses, everything is there, this is what is known as misyar. Now there's multiple angles to look at, when I, when I discuss this, and that's the way I answer questions. I don't give a simple uh, answer because I want us to understand what is going on here. The first way to, to begin this answer is to quickly do a summary of what have our modern ulama said. Well, a quick survey will show you that a large majority, overwhelming majority of scholars and fatwa councils have said that it is halal, but many of them have said it is halal but discouraged. And some have said it is halal and neither is it encouraged nor is it discouraged. So halal mubah, halal makruh. This is the default position of the majority of scholars. This is the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, the Mufti of Egypt, the Council of Muslim Scholars, the Majma' Fiqh al-Islami, the Heads Kibar ulama of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh ibn Baz, Ibn Jibreen, uh, the famous Faqih Wahab al-Zuhayli, uh, and uh, famous uh, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi as well, that uh, he writes, for example, that I have never called for zawaj misyar, nor do I encourage it, nor have I written an article encouraging people, nor have I defended misyar, nor have I given a single khutbah about misyar. However, when I was asked about it, I had to give an academically correct answer that fit with my conscience, and I could not make haram what Allah had made halal just to make the people happy, and so I say that it is halal, I think it is halal, but I don't encourage it. So this is Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi, who uh, had to issue a statement when people sir, were saying that, oh, he's encouraging misyar, he issued a disclaimer, no, I have never encouraged, in fact, I don't like it, but I cannot make haram what Allah has made halal. So this is uh, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qadawi's uh, position. On the other hand, you have a group of some very famous ulama as well, who said that the marriage is haram, such a marriage is not allowed. And some have said that it is a sinful marriage, but it is valid, so it's not just makru, but it is haram. Some have said it is batil, and some have said it is fasid. What is the difference between batil and fasid is not the point of today's talk. So the Students of Usul al-Fiqh know this if you're not Hanafi. If you're Hanafi, there is no difference. But my point is that uh, a group of ulama said this marriage is not allowed. And you have some great names here, uh, Sheikh Umar Sulaiman al-Ashqar, uh, Sheikh Ali Qurradaghi, um, the muhaddith uh, of the last generation, uh, Sheikh al-Albani, that they all said that it is haram or batil or fasid, that you cannot or should not do this marriage. And if you read their fatawa, by and large, uh, they are centering around the point that this type of marriage goes against the goals of the Sharia ah, and that generally speaking the harms that result are greater than the goods that are obtained. So the darar, the, the harm is more than the nafa or the uh, benefit. Now um, this is the second group of scholars. The, the first group they basically say that look you cannot make haram something that technically fits the, the criterion of marriage. And the bare minimum criterion are met. You have the ijab, you have the qabul, you have the acceptance and the proposal being, uh, you have the offer and the proposal, uh, you have uh, the wali, you have the mahr, you have the two witnesses. And they said, if the two of them agree to any conditions that are halal in and of themselves, who are we to get in between two people that want to get married? And it is up to the two partners. If the lady, for example, wants to give up her rights and wants to take on some potential harm, well then that's her prerogative. It's not our job to tell her we can advise her, but we cannot force her to give up her right. Indeed, our Prophet wasallam said, the most important conditions to fulfill are the conditions that allow the private parts to be halal, i.e. the nikah to take place. And he said, the Muslim honors his conditions. So if those are the conditions, so be it. And they also say that if such an agreement took place in the middle of the marriage, spontaneously, by unanimous consensus, it would be halal. So why are you, are you making it haram if it takes place in the beginning of the marriage? So, for example, uh, Sauda, our mother, 
she felt, يعني, for whatever reason, she felt that يعني, uh, maybe, maybe her marriage might end. And so from her own free will, she said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, take my night and give it to Aisha. I'll give you my night with her, you don't have to spend the night with me. So she gave up the right of her night. It's her right. She said, I don't want to take it and give it to Aisha. And she knew that the Prophet would like this, now she will, he will get two nights with Aisha. So that's what happened. Nobody forced her, it's her right. So suppose she did this at the beginning rather than the middle. Everybody would, you know, so the, the, the second group, what would they, they say to this? And Allah Azza wa Jal also says in the Quran, that if the couple thinks that they're going to split up, there is no sin on them if they negotiate a contract between them. There's no sin if they talk about some conditions so that they can come back together. So if this is allowed in the middle of the contract, uh, in the middle of the marriage, if it's allowed after 10 years, if something happens, let's say, and I know a case for example where, um, you know, the wife and husband were working uh, and subhanAllah, Allah will that the husband have, uh, you know, some type of, you know, uh, something happened, an accident happened to him, so he became incapacitated. and lost his job, there wasn't the land he was in, there was no benefits there, so he's now without a job. The wife took on the charge, which happened so many times, she took on the financial obligations, she began working, he became invalid, he could not work, so he was at home and he couldn't, uh, he was on a wheelchair, he could not work, and so she started doing the work, all the income is now on her. By unanimous consensus, this is halal, why would it be haram? So what if this agreement was done before the nikah, who are we to come and say that it is haram? This is what the majority uh, say. And if somebody were to say, but hold on a sec, isn't marriage supposed to be a sacred relationship? And this notion of misyar, it seems to cheapen that relationship. And the goal should not be the bare minimum. The goal should be a, a, a loving, fruitful marriage where uh, everybody goes beyond what they're supposed to. The response to all of this is, yes, you are right. That is the ideal. That's not what we're asking, what is the ideal or not. What we're asking is that if two people decide they want to get involved in a different type of nikah, are you qualified? Has Allah given you the authority to come between those two and to say, if you two do this, you are living in sin? This is the technical question, right? Let us leave ideal marriage to the side and let us preach the ideal marriage and let us keep that as the default. The question now, if two people decide to not have that marriage and they agree to a different type and they fulfill the requirements, does the Sharia allow them to do so? And the response, frankly, I have to agree with the majority that yes, that technically uh, it's not an ideal uh, uh, you know, marriage, it's not a marriage that is gonna be a loving and fruitful one generally speaking, but it is a marriage of, of, of pragmatic, if you like practicality. And if two people for whatever reasons decide that that is what they wanna do, then as long as the other conditions are met, technically it is halal. However, that's part number one. Let me move on to part number two, because I'm not gonna stop there. The marriage might technically be halal, but part number two, let us see the reality of how it pans out in an actual situation. Generally speaking, such marriages inevitably end in divorce. They don't last very long. Generally speaking, it is the woman who suffers much more than the man. Because you see, and I have not missed my words at all, I've spoken about this very publicly, one can espouse as many modern doctrines of gender and gender equality that one chooses, but your espousing and pontificating does not change the biological and the psychological realities. The nature of one gender is to want companionship, and admiration, and friendship, and love. And when that gender gets that, intimacy comes along. The nature of the other gender is to prioritize intimacy and sex, and put emotions and love secondary. And again, I'm speaking in generalities here. So when both of these parties enter into an, uh, 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 an agreement, a misyar, each one of them is putting in the contract the bare minimum of what the other wants, not wanting to fulfill the emotional or the other requirements that the other, the other party craves. It's not in the contract. Well then, it's only a matter of time where that train is gonna become a train wreck and a disaster. It's only a matter of time before the 
steam of the engine, you know, runs out and it's not going to continue. So the reality on the ground, technically such a marriage might be halal. The reality anecdotally, and everybody knows this and you can do surveys and studies. I haven't done one myself, but even in the world we live in, I've heard of too many of these cases, anecdotally, almost all, maybe, I don't know, 90% of such marriages, they end up in divorce. They do not last for too long. So when we look at the lived reality of misyar marriages, generally speaking, it becomes a disaster. And again, generally speaking, it is the woman who suffers. However, this is all general. Sometimes, 10% of the times, it works out. And sometimes, maybe even it doesn't work out, but for those five or 10 years where the Messiah marriage was happening, maybe, just maybe, each partner is better off with the other than if they were without the other, than if they were single. So in the end of the day, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna say technically it is halal. Realistically, generally speaking, it's not going to be a fruitful marriage. It's not going to be a long-term marriage. It will inevitably generally end in divorce. And again, generally, it is the woman who will emotionally suffer more than the man. But again, all of this is generics. All of this is stereotypes. Allah Azza wa Jal knows the future. And sometimes it does work out. I know of one case, for example, where there was a widowed lady. Uh, she was beyond the age of childbearing age. She didn't have any children. Her husband had died and uh, she had her own business. She did not want uh, what she said to me, a nagging husband. I don't want a nagging husband, but I want male companionship. I'm still, you know, I don't know her age at the time, but maybe she was in her 50s or something. I, I just want a husband to visit once in a while. And so here's a man, yani he's not, I don't want any money from him. He has his wife and children and that land polygamy was allowed. And so uh, I don't mind, you know, once a week, twice a week, we agree and I don't want any money from him. And as far as I know, you know, they are uh, together and things are going as she had wanted because that's the type of life she wanted. She didn't want to live in husband. She did not want somebody constantly with her. You know, she's happy, uh, uh, whatever the, the agreement that they agreed and things are going on. So the point being that we can speak in generalities, but there's always exceptions to the rule. So technically, misyar marriage is halal. Realistically, many of them, most of them will end up not, uh, you know, uh, for the best, but it doesn't make the marriage haram. And then before I move on to the next type of marriage, I also need to point out another reality. Let's not just discuss misyar. Let's discuss why misyar came about. Let's discuss the social conditions that allowed for such an atypical marriage to become widely accepted amongst more and more people and to get the grand muftis of multiple countries involved to give fatawa. Why is this happening that spinsterhood is on the rise? And again, this is a question I can't answer. I'm not a sociologist. I have not done an anthropological survey of what is happening, but I will tell you, and every sheikh can attest to this, that we have a crisis amongst our communities and communities around the world of a surplus of qualified young ladies and ladies that are you know, middle age, whatnot, that want to get married and they are more in percentage than the qualified men on the other side who want to get married. We have a surplus of women who are looking for good and decent husbands and they're not finding them. And spinsterhood is increasing. And because of this, misyar marriage is on the rise. Why is this happening? Again, much can be said here and we can blame the men, we can blame the women. Perhaps the blame is on kind of sort of both sides, but we also have to look at the changing social circumstances. What is going on in the world? Once upon a time, it was extremely difficult to find a woman who was economically independent. And almost all marriages, it was expected that the woman would require a husband to take care of her. But now with gender roles and the workforce changing, far more women are economically stronger. And I'm just speaking this factually. This is, I'm not using it as a positive or negative. They become financially independent. They don't need a male for uh, depending on them financially. And therefore, women feel empowered via their careers. They don't need, many of them even don't want a family. They don't want children. So they're happy, you know, or you know, they, uh, they feel they're happy the way that they are. So a part-time husband might be more ideal for them. Given all of these dynamic changes, it is not surprising 
that the realities of marriage are also changing. And we see this even in traditional marriages and gender roles in a traditional marriage. At some point in our conversation, let's move beyond misyar. Whatever your position is about misyar, we also need to discuss the changing social realities and how much of it Islam endorses and how much of it Islam allows but disapproves of and how much of it is outright haram. Gender and gender roles requires a very detailed discussion. I've spoken a little, a little bit about this in other Q&A, but it is because of what is happening in the world and because of the rise of uh, multiple understandings and interpretations of gender and gender roles that misyar marriage is on the rise. And we shouldn't just talk about misyar, we need to talk about the social realities that brings about misyar. Bottom line, as I said, technically it is halal. But I caution those who are thinking about it, especially our sisters, I caution them, I caution them, I caution them to not enter in without thinking 10 times. Because generally speaking, such a marriage will cause you emotional distress, de distress and it is going to be psychologically taxing. Think long and hard and then think long and hard and then think long and hard. And ask yourself, if five years from now this marriage breaks up, am I gonna be okay with that? If it breaks up, ask yourself. Ask your family and friends, ask your close friends. Talk to them about the reality of such a situation. Pray istikhara, understand the risks, hope for the best. But are you prepared for the worst? That is going to be about misyar marriage that really I cannot, just like Shaykh Qardawi says, well exactly Shaykh Qardawi's fatwa here, that the popular fatwa to give would be haram, haram, haram. This would make me popular. But I cannot make haram what the conditions are being met of halal. And you can say it's not ideal, fine, I agree with you. And you can say it's makru, I agree with you. You can say it's discouraged, I agree with you. But I cannot make it haram if they have both agreed. And I do think it is unwise, but unwise doesn't make it haram. So this is the opinion that I say about misyar. Now, the other brother, uh, I think Muhammad was his name, he asks that isn't misyar the same as mut'a? And we say not at all, the two are completely separate and distinct. There is no direct relationship between misyar and mut'a. Mut'a marriage is a type of marriage that was done uh, in pre-Islam uh, in which the husband and wife, uh, they agreed to get married uh, without uh, the, the need for witnesses. There was no witness, uh, there was no need for witness, and they agreed for, to get married for a particular time frame. There's a time clause added to the contract. And this was typically done by travelers, by business people going to community to community, and they would say, I'm here for one month, who's gonna marry me for one month? And a lady would say, I'll marry you for one month, you know, for you know, 100 uh, dinars. Okay, so for 100 dinars, I'll marry you for a month. When that month is over, immediately uh, the nikah automatically, it's like expires, there's an expiry contract expiry date in the contract. That is what mut'a is, an expiration date within the contract. Now, Sunni Islam, all of the Sunni schools of law, the Shafi's, Hanafi's, Maliki's, Hanbali's, even the Zahiri's, all of the Sunni schools of law, they say that mut'a, nikah was abrogated. It used to be halal in the beginning of Islam, just like drinking alcohol was halal. In the beginning of Islam, Allah didn't make it haram. Then Allah made it haram. This is the default position. However, 12 Shi'ism and also Zaydism, 5 Shi'ism, they do not view it as being abrogated. They think that mut'a is still halal. And so they have it permissible in their books, so much so that it has become one of the key differences in fiqh between Sunnis and Shia. And uh, they say that it is allowed. And so uh, they have said that you guys allow misyar just like we allow mut'a, and we say to them that no, there is no comparison. Uh, that uh, mut'a and misyar agreed in one aspect, and that is that there's no obligation to support. In mut'a, the husband does not have to support the wife. In misyar as well, that's the condition that is put. But other than that, in mut'a, there is an actual time clause. So the marriage expires when that time finishes and misyar does not have that time expiration. So there is no comparison between the two. Uh, by the way, so just FYI, uh, even muta amongst the 12 Shia, there's a bit of a contention about the conditions and whatnot and one of the senior scholars of 12 Shi'ism, uh, Ayatollah Sistani, uh, Sistani says that uh, an unmarried lady cannot 
engage in mut'a without the wali and the wali's knowledge and presence. So it's not something that is done uh, you know, w- without any witnesses, at least the wali should know. So this is just FYI that uh, even amongst them, some of them say that uh, the unmarried lady needs the wali uh, as well. But in any case, that is their fiqh, uh, our uh, Sunni fiqh, as I said, none of the established schools have allowed this. They all view this as being uh, mansukh or abrogated. So this is uh, the question about mut'a and misyar. And um, uh, some a sister asked her about this, the, the marriage that was done uh, that nobody knows about other than the two witnesses. So basically, uh, this is a marriage that is called a secret marriage. Now, what exactly is a secret marriage? So again, it depends on how you define it, but I'm being with what the sister said. And this is that the two witnesses were present, the husband and wife obviously are married, the wali is present, the mahad is given. So all of that is done, however, it is not made public, it's not publicized. And sometimes maybe even the two witnesses are told, hey, don't tell anybody else. Or the two witnesses are not told, but the couple does not tell other people. And so they perform the marriage in somebody's house and there are two witnesses present and nobody knows about this. This type of marriage, the majority opinion, three of the four madhabs say that the nikah is valid, but the point of making it uh, not public. So the term secret is a bit of a misnomer. It's not secret if two people know about it, the nikah has done. So let's just say a private nikah that is not publicized. That's a better way to put it. Because if you say secret, are you talking about only the husband, wife and no witnesses? This is without a doubt not allowed. You cannot have no witnesses uh, in an actual nikah. But if you have husband and wife and the witnesses and the wali and the the, uh, mahar is given and whatnot, so now the conditions are met but there is no publicity. The Hanafis and the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis, they say that if the marriage is not publicized, but there are two witnesses, the nikah is valid, but it is makruh. And Imam Ahmad uh, in the Mashhur in his madhab says explicitly this is the case. And uh, even so much so that even if the two witnesses are told to not tell anybody else, they said the nikah is barely valid, but it is not batil, it is not invalid. It is, it is valid, but it is makruh. The one madhab that is left is the Maliki madhab. And the Maliki madhab said that if it is not publicized, then it is not valid. It is not a marriage. And in fact, interestingly, this was the position of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah as well. Ibn Taymiyyah said, a marriage that is not publicized is not a marriage. A marriage that is not known to anybody except two people that are the witnesses and the two bride and groom, he said it is not a marriage. So if you follow the majority opinion, one would say that uh, that uh, the marriage is valid. And if you follow uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and Imam Malik, then they would say this is not a valid marriage. Now. Uh, Uh, In my own humble opinion, generally speaking, once again, secret marriages are not going to last for too long. Uh, However, there are always exceptions in which uh, one understands why it is taking place. And I'll tell you about an incident that uh, came to my attention where uh, a sister came to me uh, uh, and she wanted to marry a particular brother. And I met this brother as well. And uh, long story short, that she in fact had a very abusive, maybe even psychotic husband, right? Ex-husband, the previous husband. And uh, they were in one community. And you know, if she were to marry, she was genuinely worried about the repercussions, maybe even physical, what he might do or whatnot. And she's like, you know, I just want to get married and not tell anybody, can I just have the two witnesses know? And the public is not going to be known. And I uh, understood from the story that, you know, there's a type of threat or whatnot. So, I mean, you know, once in a while, I understand the situation. However, generally speaking, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us the default, I'linu an nikah make the nikah public, make the nikah i'lan, have it something known to people. And generally speaking, let us be brutally honest here, secrecy, generally speaking, does not result in good. When you are secret about these things, then generally speaking, you're going to end up, you know, with more harm. However, technically, technically, once again, just like the misyar marriage, If there are two witnesses, two adult Muslim witnesses, they are conscious, they know what's going on, they are there, they've witnessed it, then in the eyes of Allah, the wali is there, the ijab al-qabul takes place, in the eyes of Allah, the marriage has taken place. So 
technically I will side with the majority, but realistically, once again, I will say what I said with Misyar, and that is that generally speaking, these types of marriages would be harmful in the long run from a psychological perspective. But if the two witnesses are there, then this marriage is valid. And as for the last point of Zawaj Urfi, and our brother saying he has read a fatwa from Al-Azhar that it is halal. Firstly, what is Zawaj Urfi? This is again a modern terminology. This one is not coming from Saudi Arabia, this was coming from Egypt. So Misyar emanated from Saudi Arabia, Urfi comes from Egypt. And uh, this is again a modern phenomenon, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago again. And uh, there are two types of Urfi marriages, uh, or Zawaj Urfi. One of them is the one that Azhar has allowed. And the other one, no scholar, as far as I'm aware, has ever allowed this on earth. So it is not allowed. So you have to be very careful when you say Zawaj Urfi. It's not a fiqhi terminology. It's a modern terminology. What is Zawaj Urfi? Zawaj Urfi is section A, section B, part one, part two, two types. The first type, Zawaj Urfi, is that you're living in a land and for whatever reason, you do not want to register your marriage with the civil authorities of that land. So you do the nikah publicly in the masjid, in a hall, in a banquet, invite your friends and family, you do the whole nikah ceremony, everything, but you just don't go to the court and you don't register with the government and you don't put your name in the book of registrars and in the marriage, civil, you know, federal, whatever it might be, for whatever reason, tax purposes or whatever reason, you just don't register with the government, Muslim government, non-Muslim government, doesn't matter. This is version one of Zawaj Urfi and Al-Azhar uh, Fatwa Council and pretty much every scholar in the world is going to say, well, not every scholar, the vast majority will say such a marriage is halal. Now, whether it's wise to not register with the government, that's a separate issue. And I will say the default should be you should register with your government, with your authorities. But in the eyes of Allah, the nikah has been done and it is halal. Whether you register or not, it's not a condition of the of the zawaj that you register with your local authorities. So Al-Azhar Fatwa Council said, even if you don't register with the Egyptian authorities, in the eyes of Allah, you have have done the zawaj. This is what they have said. Now, the second type of zawaj, urfi, is completely batil. And I am not aware of any reputable scholar that has allowed this. That type of zawaj urfi, it became common amongst the uh, university students of Cairo or uh, of Egypt back in the 90s and 2000s. And that was basically a boyfriend and girlfriend. They tell their own immediate circle of friends that, hey, we're going to exchange our wedding vows and we're gonna get married and you guys know, but nobody else needs to know about this. And there's no wali and there's no mahr. And sometimes even the witnesses are not going to be two adult Muslim males. So maybe even some of her friends might know. So there is no question that that type of marriage, when there's no wali and there's no mahr and there's no two adult male witnesses, there is no question that that type of nikah is batil, batil, batil. This is just two people playing with the term nikah. You cannot have a nikah between two people if they just agree to it in a private room or if they're with yani, a group of strangers and no wali is present and no mahar is given. This is not a nikah, this is a play. And this is a play that is using the, the sharia term for something that Allah has made sacred. You are making a joke out of it. That type of zawaj urfi is simply not zawaj, even if they call it zawaj. There is no nikah without ijab and qabul, without the wali for the previously unmarried ladies. And by the way, uh, those sisters who talk about uh, that some of them got irritated that I put the wali, this is exactly why. That if you open this door, an unmarried lady, uh, you know, what is going to happen, you know, for, for, for the reality of this world that we live in. Men will take advantage of her and she is going to suffer. And that's why I said a previously unmarried lady, the, 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 the wali is a requirement. Once she has been married and once she knows what it is like to be uh, married to a man and she has a, a sense of uh, what it is because the reality is that, you know, I'm sorry to say this so bluntly, but men are not the dignified, decent, noble characters or many of them that they should be. And men will prey on and take advantage of vulnerable women. Emotionally, they will take advantage of them. So the wali comes in to keep men in check. It is not insulting to the women. It is actually saying women are innocent. Women are very pure and to protect them, the wali comes in and says, no, we're gonna raise the bar. So when you remove the wali and you have boyfriend, girlfriend, 
relationships and they amongst their own so what happens what I heard happening and I've never lived in Egypt but basically groups of boyfriends and girlfriends would tell one another hey us two are a couple you two are a couple you two are a couple and they would call this zawaj urfi this is our zawaj this is our customary zawaj we don't need the marriage we don't need any sheikh present well they don't need a sheikh as I said but they need the conditions of the nikah none of the conditions are met or I should say the majority of conditions are not met how is this zawaj that type of zawaj is simply not allowed and I'm not aware of any mainstream scholar that has allowed it. So to summarize that today's Q&A dealt with miscellaneous types of marriages that are not the ideal marriage. And we said as long as the arkan are met. So the arkan, I have mentioned them. And that is that the uh, potential husband and wife are both qualified to get married and uh, that they have agreed to get married. And if she is previously unmarried, the wali will be present and agreeing or at least his representative will be present and the mahar is there and two witnesses are there. If this is done, this is the bare minimum of a valid nikah. Other than this, if other conditions are put, then as long as both partners really are aware and they understand, you can disagree from an emotional and a wisdom perspective, but you cannot use the word haram. You cannot bring in Allah and His Messenger and say, Allah has forbidden you to, to come together. No, we cannot do that. If those conditions are met, then the nikah will be valid. It might not be wise. And I'll be the first to say, nikah misyar, generally speaking, is not a wise nikah. And the quote unquote private nikah, generally speaking, is not a wise nikah. It is simply not going to work out uh, that way. I'll be the first to say this, but if the both agree, and that's what they want, or for whatever the reasons might be, who are we to stop them? The Sharia has allowed with that bare minimal skeletal version, and if that's what they choose to do, well then, so be it, and they will have to bear the positives and the negatives, and in the end of the day, some marriages are functional marriages. Some marriages are quid pro quo, you know, for whatever reason, the two of them find benefit in their circumstance to come together in that manner. And the Sharia has allowed them, not every marriage is a fairy tale, you know, wh what type of marriage and so be it. We have to be practical. The Sharia has allowed this and the Sharia makes the other one the goal. Let us teach the goal. Let us make that the default. Let us teach our children that, but let us also be wise enough to realize that not everybody can have that default. And sometimes it is better for some exceptional circumstances to negotiate and to come to the table with a different understanding. And as long as the other partner also wants that understanding, then perhaps, perhaps it is better for the two of them to live together, even if it is for a few years without any sin and have some comfort with one another, even if they part ways later on, than to be single for that period of time. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Until next week, Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما